plant for uh, October 28, 2021. Uh, right now, we have the public opportunity to discuss matters of interest within the committee scope, including items that are on or not on the agenda. Madam Clerk, do we have any speakers? I did not have anybody contact me ahead of time, but Art, if you could please unmute everybody and give them the opportunity. Uh, there's nobody on except Metro Cable and myself. All right, perfect. <laughs> All right, we'll move on then. Uh, we have a consent item. Uh, do I have any uh, motion on the consent? I'll make a motion. Okay, I'll second that. Madam Clerk, can we get the uh, roll call, please? Director Wood? Aye. Director Sailors? Aye. Motion passes. All right, um, moving on, we have a couple presentation items uh, today. Looks like they're all yours, uh, Mr. O'Toole. So let's start with number one. I don't think anybody's on, so you can face us. Okay. <laughs> 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 number two. There you go. All right. So. Uh... Uh, thank you, directors, Chief Harms. Um, for this uh, first presentation, we've invited Matt Goss from Alpers. He is the Customer Outreach and Support Manager uh, with that uh, division there. He's come to speak to us about our status with the, uh, the uh, California Employers uh, Retirement Benefit Trust, our CERT, and, um, and open up funding, as well as offer some perspectives on our pension funding and our pension obligations. Let's see. Um, we periodically invite Alpers out for this kind of presentation. So this is kind of the one for 2021. And um, it also um, happens that it will be presented immediately afterwards the CalPERS valuation, also in the April exercise. So you have the materials there. We'll do the presentation. Um, so with no further ado, I will welcome Matt up to the front. Thank you, Dave. And it's okay if I take my mask off the top? Yeah. Okay. I'll just pull it down here. And uh, looks like everybody can see me. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. So what I'd like to do is just thank you for your time. Uh, it's been a couple of years because of COVID-19 since I've been able to come out in person and talk to you about how well you're doing. Um, basically, in August of uh, 2012, SAC Metro Fire decided to start setting money aside in advance to pay for uh, retiring medical, dental, and vision benefits. They made promise. They call these OPEBs. OPEB stands for Other Post Employment Benefits. And uh, the reason we would do that is because these benefits are not inexpensive. They're very in, they're very expensive, and they're also very volatile in terms of their cost. They go up over time. Um, they average a rate of somewhere between four and six percent annually. But they don't just move slowly and smoothly in that direction. They can jump up twelve percent one year and be one percent the next year. So it makes budgeting for these costs challenging to say the least. And so the idea is to make it a cheaper process long-term, but also make it a smoother, less volatile process from one year to the next. So it's easier to manage uh, a lot more stable. So at CalPERS, we have economies of scale that are very, very strong. Uh, we can do something like this on behalf of uh, SAC Metro Fire uh, very inexpensively and save you a bunch of money. So we're gonna talk about how we've done um, since uh, uh, 2012. What I'd like to do is start on slide number two. And so I'll go there now. I'm just going to point out a couple of things. I'll try not to bore you because there's a lot of data here. Uh, and then if there's questions, I'll answer the questions, which I think is much more enjoyable for everybody. So as you can see in the fourth row, that's bolded. It's titled Total OPEB Liability. Back in 2017, when Catherine McLeod, your OPEB actuary, measured the total amount of benefits that had been earned as of that date in the summer of 2017, it was over $216 million. And then two years later, uh, when she remeasured, it was $243 million. So why did it go up? It, it goes up because each day those active employees come to work over that two-year period they accrue more of those benefit promises, right? And because of that, the number goes up. But you also added uh, employees. You went from 1,364 total active and retired covered lives to 1,417. So that's another reason why these things go up, okay? So when you break that into annual costs, so the total purchase price of the house is one thing, but the mortgage payment over the course of 12 months is another thing, but you see that going up as well. So in the other bolded row titled, 
determined contribution, actually determined contribution, you can see it went from 20.1, almost 20.2 million in 2017 to 22.7, almost 22.8. So, you know, that's the problem, right? Okay, so what you did about it was something really positive. As I mentioned, you decided to be proactive as opposed to just paying your bills on a monthly basis as they show up in the mailbox. You said, we're gonna do something a little bit different. And you started out in 2012 by sending us a little bit more than $1.7 million. And then you added to that on consistent uh, annual basis, and I'll show you that next, over $45.5 million. And then we were able to take that and generate another just under $25 million over a period of 9.17 years. And to do all of that work, and this is all inclusive, it's not just what we charge, it's our investment manager our internally, our external investment manager, custodian, my salary, the gasoline in my truck that I'm you know, charging to drive over here tonight, I live in the pocket area, so it's not that far, but a grand total of $216,777. So, you know, nine years ago, if I would have walked in the room and said, hey, I can probably make you around 25 million for 200 grand, are you good with that? Most people would have said, yeah, I like that, let's do it. So this was a really good thing, but I didn't do it. All we did was create diversified portfolios using stocks and bonds. You chose the one, you sent us the money. So it's really sack metric fire. It's people like Dave O'Toole. Uh, it's people like Ron and for dad. Uh, you know, Rhonda McFarland was part of setting this thing up back then. You know, I, I brought you all on board. Um, that made a good decision. Obviously, the board made you know that final decision. And so, congratulations to all of you for um, some success so far. And I wish you more of it as we keep on moving forward. You can see that you've got over seventy-one million in assets now, and you've earned a rate of return of more than nine and a half percent annualized, and that's net of all fees over that period. So you're doing great. Okay. So enough bragging. Uh, basically what you do every single year, and you can see this row by row is each fiscal year. So it's each budget cycle is how I like to think about it. You just keep on pounding away and money's going in and nothing's coming out. And so you're building this big pot of money that's exposed to a, you know, around a 7% investment environment. And so the compounding interest income from this is, is very positive. And over time, um, the probability is, is that you're probably going to earn around six and a half to 7% based on the current projections of the, the horsepower and capability of this, this investment engine we're using. Um, and that's just going to save you a lot more money than late for county treasury would, which was earning around, you know, let's say one to 2% annualized over that same 10 year period or so. So you're just on a really good path. Um, you can see that that's affecting your funded status in OPEB. Now, unlike pension, where you might be around, let's say, 80% or something like that, maybe it's even less, but nonetheless, you've been pre-funding that. You've been proactive in the pension space since day one. You were not proactive here until nine years ago, and you're already 17% funded. So you are moving in the right direction. You're whittling away at a really large you know, uh, set of costs, um, and you're doing that um, pretty pretty steadily. You can see you went from one to six to 13 to 17%. And the whole entire time, the OPEB liability was growing, but your assets were going faster. So if they're running in a marathon race shoulder to shoulder, one of them is going a little bit further down the path and that's the assets. And that's what you want. Okay. So now on slide number, uh, let's go to, this is just some, some boring stuff. Slide number eight, if you're you know with me uh, through, the, uh, through the internet. Um, you can see that our report card, so I just showed you your report card, it's also very good. Um, what we try to do is a lot like what Jack Bogle at Vanguard does, is passively invest money using stocks and bonds in a broadly diversified portfolio to outperform benchmarks. So we're not trying to be hotshot investors over a three month or six month period. We're really focused on the long term. The reason for that is these benefits are long term benefits that you're paying out to people generally until they die. And so there's a lot of decades involved in that process to pay for them or finance them and then to kind of allowance them out in the form of a monthly allotment. So as long as we continue to outperform benchmarks consistently over the short term, the mid term and the long term, which we've done here, and we do it all for a really low cost, you know, I think the value is clear. So we're doing our job here. And uh, hopefully, you know, you can appreciate that. So that's an update on OPEB. And just to pause real quick, does anybody have any questions on the other post-employment benefits pre-funding that we've done for you for almost a decade now? Okay, so if you do let me know, uh, chime in. What I wanted to do is I wanted to move to cost real quick, what we're charging you and how we're charging. Because I told you a total number and that number was relatively low 
but I want you to understand how we do it. So we're not for profit. We're the only entity out there in California that does this not for profit. So because of that, it's cheaper than our competitive options that are available to you. Um, we set a fee rate and we apply that fee rate uh, against assets under management. So every agency that participates with us is about 600 agencies, about $17 billion in the trust. They pay different amounts, but they pay the same rate, right? So the milk costs the same, the gas is the same price per gallon for everybody that drives up, but their gas tanks are all different sizes. So in your case, right, it's 10 basis points of assets under management or 10 one hundredths of a single percent you know, and uh, we apply that every single day to your total balance. And then we divide it by 365 and we charge you a few bucks. And that's all available in our online record keeping system to log in and see and folks like Dave do that. And, you know, they hold us to account and make sure we're not taking more than we should take or less than we should take. And you can see we've been real consistent in that surf column in the middle. You can see that we started off really low and then all the bills started to catch up with us, right? And we started to go up a little bit, but as those employers got through the global financial crisis and things started to turn around and they started giving us money um, and a lot of it, uh, we were able to bring that down to a real steady state rate that is very close to the fixed cost floor, which is around nine some odd, kind of like a little bit more than nine basis points. So we round up to 10 and to ensure we don't under collect. So there you have it. I mean, it's a pretty simple, straightforward program. Uh, you can see that we've got uh, 33, 32 other fire agencies in California that do this with us and 326 special districts and other public agencies. So we're no stranger to this space. I think we do a good job of trying hard to understand your needs and what you're trying to achieve. And we'd love to learn more. If we're not doing that, please call me directly if you ever want to talk. So uh, I know you're going to talk about pension and I don't want to get too far ahead of this because Dave's got a nice presentation prepared. I'm going to sit and listen to that as well. I'm looking forward to that, Dave. But I want to talk to you a little bit about your situation. So you've got a miscellaneous plan, a new PEPRA miscellaneous plan, you've got a safety plan. And that's just based on you know, what the employees do, what their job duty statements indicate that they're hired to do. But what I want to focus on is the $491 million down there in red that you currently are underfunded. Okay, and you're like a lot of other agencies in aggregate, you're about 64% funded, you can see the pepper plan and the miscellaneous plan are doing much better than the safety plan because it's just more expensive. Okay, that's because people in the safety plan retire earlier. And so they're not working as long so it's just a shorter period of time to invest and hit those targets the benefits also a little bit more generous. And so you're a little bit lower there. Um, but that's going to cost you about 7% interest. So imagine that amount of money is your balance on a 7% credit card. So everybody in the room probably understands if you pay that off as quickly as you can, as you can afford to, that can be really economically beneficial. And you can see that CalPERS is allowing you to pay that off over 24 years. And if you do it that way, uh, which is the legal minimum amount that they're going to require, you're going to incur about $413 million in interest. But if you do it faster at your discretion, when the budgetary conditions allow for you to do it, when everybody's on board and agrees that that's the best move on the chessboard, you can save, let's say, if you cut it to 15 years, over 20 million bucks. If you cut it down to 10 years, which may not be economically feasible or palatable, um, you can save over $130 million. Um, so these are called additional discretionary payments. You would make them directly to CalPERS. You would call your CalPERS pension actuary to set these up, and you can save you know, a good chunk of change. And I, and I highly recommend that you consider exploring that, and if you can work it into your budget, um, that can save you a lot of money. What I do know is that in today's marketplace, there's not a lot of 7% risk-free annuity products. So that's a real good product, unless there's some other option out there where you can save even more money for the same amount of risk, which is pretty much nothing. So I really like that. Now that's not what I sell. I sell a 115 trust to finance future pension contributions, just like pre-funding OPEB, you would pre-fund the future pension contributions. So these are just different plans here. So what I wanted to encourage you, and I'm gonna step aside just because I don't wanna be in your way here, I want everybody to see this, is to consider doing both of these things I talked about. So the reason you would do the additional discretionary payments and pay down that debt I've already, I've already talked about, right? And everybody probably thought that makes a lot of sense, but let's look into the particulars if it works for our district. But I also think a 115 trust would be a really great place to put some money, about three months of pension costs at a minimum. And uh, we can go to that here. I wanna show you, I think I have a slide here. 
uh, that would be about $13 million to cover three months of cost for all three of those plans. And if you ran into a really rainy day, that would cover you for probably a couple budget cycles to pay those bills that CalPERS is going to demand you pay that are increasing so that you didn't have to rob from various line items in the budget to pay that one. So you don't have to rob from various Peters to pay the CalPERS Paul because you'd have a bucket set aside and you'd be earning probably four to five percent on that money as opposed to the one to two percent if you were to do the same thing but put it in lay for county treasury. So that's the first thing. And we can talk about all of this in the future if you're interested. The second thing is what if I actually just cycled this like some folks used to ladder bonds or certificates of deposit? So if I know that, for example, I've got future payments, this is your debt <laughs> payment schedule, but you could do normal cost as well, which is a perpetual ongoing cost. And what if I knew I had that every year, 10 years going, and I saved money annually, and I put it on a, let's say, a eight year investment cycle. So I didn't touch the money, I just left it with Matt and his team for eight years. How much money could I save? So what that orange row there for the 28-29 fiscal year is showing you that if your bill in the 28-29 fiscal year is $47 million, if you gave us $32 million today and we earned you 5% every single year for eight years, we would generate the difference between the 32 million and the 47. So about 15 million bucks for you. And that would be your savings. And I've worked at CalPERS for almost 15 years now. And let me tell you what I've never found is a CalPERS coupon anywhere. It's not on the internet, it's not under my desk, it's not downstairs in the cafeteria at the gym. So that's a pretty cool idea. And I just wanted to kind of plant the seed today. And if you ever want to talk about that, let me know. Um, it's something that you know I would be happy to come back and discuss. Um, I'm not on commission, so I'm not here to sell you a car today. So just know that that's something that I'd be willing to talk to you about until the cows come home. And if it's something you want to do, then you know we can set that up. So that's all I really had, Dave. Um, I wanted to thank you all for your time tonight. And with respect to that, I want to stop. Um, here's my contact information in the top row. That uh, mobile phone is a phone that you pay for and you know, all the customers pay. So you can call it at night, you can call it in the morning, you can call it on Saturday if you need to. I don't, you know, I don't mind. I work for you. So um, any questions? Any questions for Mr. Bell? Matt, on the, on the, the pre-funding uh, scenario, um, was that the, the 13 million that was put into that account that you showed there, the 13.2? No, that, that? no it's, a, it's a good question. No, this is a hypothetical would-be scenario for you in the future if you decided to do it, and it's related to pre-funding pension costs. Mm -hmm. The OPEB stuff that I showed you in the very beginning that's stuff that you actually already did. So I'm reporting. You know, right, no, but I just, the, uh, we oh. have the pre-funding portion of it on here. You had one that was at 13 million for the, for the three months. Is that connected to that? that those two are connected. They are. So yeah, let me okay. clarify that. That's a, that's a very great question. I'm glad you asked. Okay. So we're talking about pension and Dave's going to show you your annual cost probably as part of the presentation. And this would be that multiplied by 0.25. The reason I did that, just so you know, is because um, when you look at investment loss potential in any given year, which would generate in two years in the future, increased CalPERS costs, you normally won't see anything greater than about 25%. And the reason for that is that's about two standard deviations removed from the mean. And so there's a 95% probability that you won't see anything that extreme. But we've seen it twice in my 15 years. Once was the global financial crisis, and a second time was the coronavirus. Now, the good thing about the coronavirus, if there is a good thing, is that period of loss only lasted about three months, and then it just came roaring back, right? Whereas with the global financial crisis, the recovery was much longer. Those are the ones that are uglier. Those are the ones that you want to avoid that we tend to see happening once a decade, if that. But that was a once in a hundred year event. So the things that happen once a decade are usually about half as um, as bad in terms of the amount of loss. So this would cover you probably twofold in most ugly scenarios that were typical within a decade span. That's why I use that number. Okay. A lot of people are surprised because 13 million around here is not a ton of money because it's all relative, right? Um, they're surprised by how little the price of admission would be for there to be value in doing that. And would it even be worth our time? But it would certainly be worth your time because the problem with 
finding 13 million mid year in a budget cycle, knowing you have you know to pay the piper pretty soon, is you have to disappoint and upset a lot of people, and that can become political and it can affect personnel and morale, and you know that's just stuff you want to avoid. So I really think that that's a really cheap investment to stabilize your operation in a way that's really meaningful. Can I ask one more question? Go ahead. <laughs> um, but I'll switch a little bit to your other our other top there. What do you see happening with the discount rate as we move forward? Yeah. And then with the return this past year of 21%, mm -hmm. how will that be an impact do you see for organizations as they move forward? Sure. So let me uh, address the question in inverse, the, the second part of your question I want to okay. first. Okay. So um, if, if you all didn't hear that, uh, the question was, you know, how much help will the 21.3% CalPERS pension fund return as of June 30, 2021, you know, provide for the district? Uh, it will be significant. It will be very helpful um, in terms of how it will hit your funded status and take it from 63% to some number I just can't say because your plan is very specific mm -hmm. and your benefits are quite rich. And it's gonna really depend a lot in this specific scenario on the average age of your active employment population. So if it's younger, it will probably help um, less in the near term. If it's older, it will help more in the near term. In, in the long term, it, it, will, it will average out and be very similar. So 21.3 is great, okay? We're very um, young, so thank you. Okay, perfect. Okay, so you know it, it's more of a long-term application. Then, okay, um, so you'll just see the benefits spread out uh, more conservatively over a longer period of time. Um, with respect to discount rate, my experience in the last fifteen years at Calpers with their policy, and then my experience looking at capital market assumptions over the past twenty years, is that they've been going down at the same level of risk. So basically, to simplify this, okay. If you want to earn 7% today, it's a lot more risky than it was 10 years ago and even more than it was 20 years ago. It's just harder to do. And so CalPERS is probably not interested in increasing the amount of risk that they hold. And so they're more interested in bringing down the discount rate such that they can collect that investment principal at a higher rate from the employers to finance the operation. And so I think that's the direction they've gone in without knowing everything, because I'm you know, mid-level management and they don't bring me into the room and ask me my opinion all the time. Um, but I think we're more likely to go down again than we are to stay the same or go back up. I can see us staying the same for a little while, but that's not what the capital market assumptions have been telling us annually for years. So let's say it went down to six and a half percent. Yeah, your costs are gonna go up. And as a rule of thumb, every time a discount rate goes down by a full percentage, we're talking about hundred basis points, you would see a 10% increase in the liabilities. So then if your assets didn't change by 10% growth rate, then you're dropping 10% on your fund status. So it's an issue. And that's why a 115 trust can also be helpful. And with respect to time, I'll end it here. And this is more no questions. So Dave, just let me know where I'm at because I want to answer your question, Todd. Um, a 115 trust can help pad that. But I don't talk about it a lot proactively because I don't want to use fear in a what if potential scenario in the future to sell something that's already a really good idea anyway, but it's probably a third, fourth, or fifth reason for sure. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. No, no, I, I, great question. I just didn't want to take his time. Any other questions? Thanks so much. Thank you. Appreciate your thank you. time. And thank you everybody on, uh, is that Zoom? Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to Zoom out of here. <laughs> Uh, I'm gonna just pivot a little bit here. <laughs> okay, so um, that was an excellent uh, 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 issue in itself, but also a great, inter a great uh, introduction into what I'm going to talk about. And actually, the valuation, uh, much of what Matt was using for his presentation, incorporated the valuation. So uh, there'll be some, a little bit of duplication here, but I'll try to keep it to a minimum note of where it happens. Um, so the, the annual valuation, as the name suggests, we get a valuation from her. It's usually around September timeframe, and it, it, it covers the, um, the uh, it, it uses data from the, that ends on the prior fiscal year. So in this case, the valuation through June 30th, 2021, includes projections for the subsequent uh, fiscal years. 
um, so which I'll cover in a moment. So um, for this, okay, there's um, the first slide is uh, our next slide is let's start with the basics, like what makes up our plan. Um, this slide shows the number of current staff and retirees at each plan of our three plans that were in miscellaneous PEPRA, miscellaneous classic and safety, um, and the number of actives and retirees. The support ratio is just the, uh, is just the number of actives divided by the number of retirees, and sort of indicative of how many um, uh, active staff we have supporting retirees, so to speak. Um, and just as a reminder about our three plans and how they're, they're built, uh, the miscellaneous PEPRA um, is staff who will receive 2% at 62. Our miscellaneous classic includes employees hired in 2013, and they will receive 3% at 60. And of course, our safety, which by far makes up the bulk of Metro Fire, uh, is uh, has sort of has two parts. It has the, the classic and the and the PEPRA part in it. And the classic is 3% at 50, and the uh, PEPRA safety is 2% at 57. Um, Next, let's look at the pension costs associated with the three plans. So I'm going to do three slides covering each of those specific plans. We'll start with the uh, uh, easiest, if you will, uh, PEPRA. A um, little bit of the anomaly relative to the other two, as we'll see. But um, these are, you know, for our 36 employees and no retirees. Uh, these are, uh, uh, as PEPRA, as you call, to recall, took place in January of 2013. And I don't know anyone hired after that or anyone who left class status for six months or more came back in a PEPRA, um, as a PEPRA employee. Um, they have a lower level of benefits than the classic. And, um, and to look at the chart, the blue column is the normal cost or the cost that Metro Fire pay, pays to PERS to operate the system for a, a year. And it does not include the prior accrued liabilities, also known as the unfunded accrued liabilities. Those are the orange bars at the bottom, pretty small to see there. Um, as you recall, PEPRA mem members pay 50% of the normal costs and the employer Metro Park pays the, the other 50%. Um, again, the orange columns are unfunded accrued liability. And then those orange columns become gray, if you will, as we move into projections from 2023, 24 out to 2027, 20, 28. These projections and the projections I'm about to show you for safety and miscellaneous PEPRA, that's all, those were all provided in, in, the, uh, in the annual evaluation by first. Um, okay, so next slide. So here's the classic, uh, 45 or so actives and some number of retirees, 133 was it? Um, let's see, uh, the gray line at the, at above there, that represents the combined normal and UAL. Uh, this uh, and the uh, you can see where it's headed, and it's got a pretty steep trajectory upwards. And uh, and then the gray lines are just the UAL, the unfunded accrued liability. We didn't include normal cost on on this, and that wasn't provided by by PERS in the valuation, so I didn't didn't want to guess. But you can see what the where it is headed, and increasing costs. And more starkly here is here's the safety plan. Here's the bulk of what we um, are invested in. So the gray line again has a pr pr pretty steep trajectory. Um, uh, you notice the blue column. It's you can barely make it out, but it's it's rides rising somewhat, but it's a relatively flat. But it's going up. So there's an increasing employee cost every year, uh, if, if slight. Um, you know, if, if you look at the the combined normal and UAL, which is the gray line, which only goes halfway because it didn't project it out without knowing the normal cost for sure, for certain. Uh, let's see, it went from about 28 million a year in 2018-19 to 42 million a year for 22-23. And obviously on the trajectory, it looks posed, uh, poised to reach 70 million or higher five years after that. If everything else being frozen the same, which will give the caveats um, in a moment. We just heard about the investment return last year, so that's part of it. Um, and so again, the gray columns are the PERS UAL projections and their most recent valuation. Those are the numbers we were provided. And so, you know, for context here, you know, for a district that's an annual budget of about 275 million, you know, anything that's going to take uh, move at a rate uh, where it's increasing for about 10% per year is going to is going to consume a, would otherwise consume a large portion of our budget, um, especially when we're talking about possibly a 70 million dollar cost in an additional six years. Next. Okay, so funded ratios is a little bit of overlap here with what Matt was covering. 
Um, we've just seen you know, how the cost could go up. So now we're gonna look backwards for a minute at funded ratios and trends. Um, this is a five year look backwards and um, uh, at the uh, at funded ratios, which is the uh, how much assets are, how much assets cover long term liabilities. And uh, considering these ratios, CalPERS looks carefully at several factors. I'm going to just give you some uh, amortization policies and assumptions, actuarial cost assumptions, employer contribution rates, employee contribution rates, intergenerational equity, uh, benefit security, and the volatility of the assumptions, um, and of course, investment returns. So you can see how funded ratios have jumped around uh, a little bit over the last five years. So PEPRA you know, almost 90, went up to 95, dropped down to 92, and back at 90. Um, the classic has generally slipped over the, over the five-year period from 75.2, but went up to 76, is now down at 73. Safety, 64.7, got up to 67.3, is now down at 63.4. And those two bullets at the bottom I provided just for perspective. Um, on our funded ratios for, for uh, 2020-21. Um, you know, the funded ratio for all CalPERS safety plans, uh, uh, local state, is 68%. So we're, we're below that at 63.4 uh, in the last valuation. And our funded, the funded ratio for the entire CalPERS fund, they say is about 80%. And um, obviously our classic is below that at 73%. Next slide, amortization schedule and alternatives. Uh, this shows the current 20 or 23, actually 24 amortization schedules and alternatives by plan. So we actually just looked at these numbers with the 15 and the 10 year projections, just uh, presented them again. Uh, again. Um, uh, some things that a couple of comments I'd like to make on the schedules is that, you know, up until a few years ago, amortization schedules were more along the lines of like 30 years. And so CalPERS is, um, uh, you know, and wanted to improve the funding and realizing the size of the hill and drawn those back for, you know, Pepper's on a 20 year schedule, Classic and Safety are on a 23 or 24 schedule. And um, uh, they also recommend a few different tools. Matt just gave us a description of the ADPs, um, that, uh, additional discretionary payments, which can be, can be just lump sum payments. If we have some extra cash to around, we're going to put it towards this debt and, and buy it down. You can do, you can also do the, a series of ADPs that is an option as well. Um, there's the fresh start option, um, which if I get this right, Matt is gonna be, it's like a, it's a five year ramp up to a higher level, um, a higher level funding to negotiate with the actual and what that would look like for, for the district. Um, and then there's a, it's a, called a, a targeted uh, projection. Uh, I guess you call it a targeted projection where you can work with CalPERS. Uh, if you wanna set a certain, we wanna, we want to reach 80% in 18 years. You can set sort of refined, uh, refined numbers for what maybe you know what a, an entity may be comfortable with. Um, also, just want to mention that Calpers doesn't uh, doesn't formally recommend this, but in their um, conference last week on uh, uh, the actual evaluations and the status of the fund and so forth, they mentioned pension obligation bonds. And noted that. It's really been a big increase in their use over the last couple of years among local agencies from about 700,000, excuse me, 700 million to about 3.5 million in issuance size in the last two years. So it's, a, it's a, becoming a more a common topic of conversation among local agencies and funding their pension debt. So the next slide, something we've already covered a little bit is the, uh, what I call the pension expense X factors. Um, and sort of that it, yeah, definitely some downer news. This is a little more mixed here. Um, uh, the discount rate, you know, which is of course the assumed rate of investment return on June 30th of 2020, um, had been uh, projected at 7%. Of course, we had the COVID down, COVID downturn. It was 4.7%. So, if we were, to, uh, so that that causes the hill to climb a little bit. The investment return wasn't as much as we wanted. So we had a gain of about somewhere just over 10% that year. Um, in our uh, in our liability, our unfunded accrued liability, um, but uh, of course the next year we had twenty one point three percent. That's what that second bullet is. Um, you know, there's a two year lag between investment returns and rate setting. You know, so our returns we won't be able to see, if you will, or, or reflect that increase until June thirtieth of twenty uh, twenty two. Um, and uh, I. I, I think we're probably fairly fairly familiar with the discount rate and the uh, investment return interaction and how, uh, and that's something that was just uh, describing before, how if the discount rate uh, is 
probably going to be lowered from seven to six point eight percent. The the board, the Calpers board policy on the matter dictates that it be six point eight percent. They're going to meet in mid November <coughs> to uh, consider that they can go lower if they want. Um, I suppose it's their policy; they could change it if they want, but the expectation is six point eight percent or lower. So that will be an offsetting factor, of course, for this 21.3% investment, wonderful investment return, if you will. Um, but it's just something to keep in mind. We, we won't realize the full benefit, if you will, of a 21.3% return uh, next year. Um, let's see. Yeah, I also just note that there's other, uh, several other states are, are doing what, what Calpers is doing in terms of lowering their discount rates while they have these investment these higher investment returns that have similar policies. Uh, let's see, New York, Ohio, Virginia, North Carolina, and Oregon, just to name a few, so the, the, not exceptional. CalPERS is not necessarily exceptional in that way. Um, uh, other considerations to mention, you know, we do have a growing number of PEPPER employees who will gradually improve your overall fundedness because, um, because their retirement benefits are not as rich, if you will, as the safety and the miscellaneous classic employees. Um, we were talking earlier, uh, at GMST and Chief Harms earlier and others uh, about this, and there's supposed to maybe like six years before you start to actually see that benefit, um, or it's not currently being openly recognized. It's not something we're factoring in right now. Um, so with that, I think I will conclude and open for any questions. Any questions for uh, Dave? Wonderful. Okay. 21% is good. 21% is good. I know you don't work on that. <laughs> Moving on to number three, our financial report through August 31. Okay. All right, chance to queue that up. Matt, are you going to take off? Yeah, I okay. want to say thank you. Though. Yeah, thank you for being here. It's really informative. Really great job. We'll be in touch. Thanks. Okay. So this is the bi-monthly uh, fiscal report uh, through August 31, 2021. This is a regular presentation for all of you, my first time through, so bear with me. Um, but, but I did have a lot of uh, good material to go from my predecessor and, uh, and the finance staff, of course. So um, let's see, uh, this, this presentation is drawn from the report you received as part of your packet. Uh, I did want to note that there were two corrections that came out later this week. I'll just describe again here. Uh, we had to correct the prior year number for the general fund cash balance that was with Sacramento County on August 31, 2020. Um, we had uh, mistimed and misreported that. So that correction will accurately shows now that at that point we were um, in the, uh, the borrowing period instead of being above uh, uh, county borrowing period, the dry period. Uh, and then the, actual, the other correction was clarifying that the CERT fund has an investment expense associated with brokerage fees. And I think it Called a uh, investment earnings, which you probably wouldn't consider that unless we were the brokerage. Um, so, okay. So, next slide is we're going to look at a series of charts just uh, uh, documenting our, our fiscal position after the two months. So, this slide is our cash balance uh, trends relative to last year. Uh, the trend line follows the historical pattern, as you can see, where we spend into the dry period where borrowing from the county is necessary until property taxes start to come in in December and then December. I'm sorry, December and April of next year. Uh, you can see that our cash balances are slightly lower than last, but they also started slightly lower than yet last year and have trended, uh, the green line have trended along with the red line pattern after just two months. Next, we have the general operating fund, uh, medic cost revenue. Uh, these are medic cost revenues or recoveries. Uh, and to familiarize you with the line colors there, the red line is the actuals. The green line is the prior year revenues and the blue line is the budgeted revenues. Um, total anticipated annual revenue is uh, 42.9 million as the slide shows. And we were slightly ahead of schedule, uh, 9.8 and 18.3% over the estimated revenues in the first two months of the fiscal year. And overall medic cost revenues are 29% over last year's revenues after two months, which is probably a COVID related factor where they might have been suppressed last year. This, is, this may be more of a normal year that we're seeing. Next is uh, general operating fund total revenues. This slide shows us on track with general fund revenues after two months. 
Uh, only 3% of annual revenues were received because the majority of tax revenues are received later, as I just mentioned, in December and April. Uh, the other major revenue source, also as I just mentioned, medic cost, medic cost revenue is, is on target overall. Next, uh, generate general operating fund salary and benefit expense. Um, you can see we're tracking closely with budget again, uh, but slightly over. Employee wages are slightly ahead because of the constant staffing, because of constant staffing, which is the callbacks, of course, uh, are up significantly. Some of this is due to deployments, um, but also attributable to staff shortages, maybe caused by sick leave, COVID, or deferral of a, the fire academy class, which uh, bringing in new recruits. Next slide, uh, general operating fund total expenditures. Uh, let's see, general fund expenditures relative to our budget. In prior year spending is slightly lower than expected, about seven million less than budget, two million less than the, than the uh, prior year. Uh, it's too early to say that this may be just a timing issue uh, for general fund expenditures as we may be back at the budget level before too long. Next, let's take a look at general fund reserves. So the, uh, we're look, again following a similar, similar pattern. Um, you can see in the table below how reserves are expected to change over the course of this year as our major revenue sources come in. Uh, on 7-1, we're at 13.5%. Uh, we're down to negative 3.4 into the borrowing period, dry period, and then expect to be by the end of the fiscal year at 14.1%. And uh, CERP just can't get enough of CERP tonight. Um, this slide shows our contributions and earnings uh, in the California Employer, Employers Retirement Benefit Trust. And uh, this is not a cash fund and monies in this trust <coughs> can only be used to pay for future retiree health premiums. Uh, but we know this to be a priority focus. So I wanted to present that tonight, um, the balance here tonight. Uh, and while both the contributions and earnings have grown in recent years, it's important to keep in mind, as Matt just told us, that the overall liability is about 243.9 million. Finally, just a few takeaways. Uh, let's see, the cash balance of 1.9 million is slightly lower uh, than the prior year level after two months. That difference is small, about 4 million, um, but we're keeping an eye on it. Overall revenues are tracking closely with prior year revenues and budget, so no real surprises there. Expenditures are trending slightly lower than prior year and budget. And last, the general fund reserve on August 31 is at negative. Uh, 8.2 million, slightly higher than the prior level, um, and small enough at such an early point, it's difficult to say that um, it's really meaningful, but that's where we stand. So, subject to your questions, I it concludes my brief. Okay. Any questions for uh, Mr. Brooks? Not soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Welcome. You yeah, got through that first one without any, <laughs> any hiccups. <laughs> Look forward to many more. more to go, right? Yeah. <laughs> You're not up to that. <laughs> All right. Uh, our next meeting uh, is to be determined. Uh, and uh, unless there's any other questions or comments from my colleagues and the chief, uh, we'll go ahead and adjourn this meeting for today. Thank you. Thank you.